Welcome everyone to Quarantine 10 by 10. Take it away, sis. made an essential run to the bank the other day. And would you believe that the security guard at the door did not even bat an eye? Of course, neither did anybody else, considering that the whole place was filled with people who had their faces covered. <laughs> well, the bandana, popular accessory as of late, conjures up images of cowboys, bandits, uh, workers' rights activists. Heck, even Rosie the Riveter wore a bandana, right? But, you might be surprised to learn that the word bandana is actually derived from a Sanskrit word meaning to tie or to bind together. And the garment itself is based on traditional colorful scarves worn in, you guessed it, India. 18th, 19th century, uh, one of the East India companies started importing them to the Western world. Uh, they achieved popularity, caught on, and 
There you have it, the bandana. Incidentally, that pattern that has come to be associated traditionally with the bandana, you might also be surprised to learn, is actually Persian. It's a Persian textile pattern. And while American traditionalists are tempted to call them Persian pickles, uh, it was actually the Scottish textile town, Paisley, that won out for the name. The bandana. Welcome to 10 by 10. How's it going, everybody? Uh, go ahead and start doing this comedy in quarantine. I'll start by telling you that I'm Asian. Uh, this is not my fault, by the way. Um, I totally gave up bat for New Year's. It's weird when you have one of these uh, global pandemics, right? Because the news loves to show Asians uh, wearing those masks. And I think it's kind of messed up because it makes me question my childhood love of ninjas. You know, like, I thought they were badass killers, not germaphobes. I wonder, though, if there was ever a time a ninja was like, hey, did you say assassinate or vaccinate? I can't hear you. Pull down the mask. I'm, it's too hard to hear. I'm uh, Vietnamese. Um, sometimes when people find that out, they like to talk to me about Vietnamese food, like I invented it or something. They'll come up to me and they're like, oh, you're from Vietnam? Pho. How good is that? That is a weird way to bond with a stranger. You know what I mean? I can't do that. I can't go up to someone and go, oh, you're from Italy? Olive Garden. Delicious. I think, though, we do have a lot of things in common, um, like drinking. Drinking is a great thing that you're in common. I just don't think you should drink in high school because I don't think you really know your body when you're that young. Like, I learned that I have something called Asian glow, and it means if you drink lots and lots of alcohol, you can't process it, your face, my face would turn beet red, my eyes would turn red, and it wasn't fun, you know what I mean, in high school, I'd drink, my parents would see my red face, I would get grounded, you know, and uh, you shouldn't drink because you know your body, it happened to the, the other kids too, right, they drink, what happens, they'd get pregnant, so you got to know your body is what I'm trying to say, uh, I grew up in Waco, Texas, uh, in the 80s. Uh, that's when all those movies like Platoon and Full Metal Jacket and Rambo were coming out. So the neighborhood kids would only invite me to play war. It, it totally sucked because they always got to be the American soldiers. I always had to be the Vietnamese prostitute. I'd be like, all right, I will say $5 make you holler, but I am not wearing this lipstick. All right, see you tomorrow. Love you. Long time. My wife is uh, white, um, and you know, I don't think she means to be racist, but sometimes she is. She's watching all of these uh, Game of Thrones. She's catching up on Game of Thrones now. She's like trying to get me to watch it. And I was watching a little bit. I go, you know, this is, I don't like it. There's no Asians on Game of Thrones. And my wife was like, well, what about the dragons? I was like, all right, good point. Racist, but good point. I'll watch it. What flavor? Popcorn is this, white cheddar or white power? Either way, it's a little salty, okay? My wife and I shared a major milestone recently in our lives. Uh, she forced me to go to couples counseling, just in case you were wondering, how white is she? Yeah, I overcooked the eggs, and she was like, hey, I want to talk to a supervisor. That's what it feels like, right? Going to a therapist, it's like the ultimate, I want to talk to the manager. I think seeing a counselor, though, is great if you like being told you're wrong by two people. Um, three if you count her mom on speakerphone. I was like, yeah, this disapproval in surround sound is crystal clear, but I don't think I have the fidelity problems, if you know what I'm saying. I learned about the love languages when I was in uh, counseling. I don't know if you... <laughs> it's the way, essentially, it's the way my wife gives and receives love. And it's my job to figure out what that is. So great, not only do I have to be a provider, I have to be charming, I also have to be a translating detective. That's great. There were no subtitles on her, you know? I would just be like, uh, listen, I don't speak vagina. And, and I don't know if you know this or not, but there's five of them. There's five of them and uh, you know, I, you have to find the right one. That means every relationship has like an 80% chance of failure. Uh, I know it's a math joke, but I can do that because some of my best friends are numbers. My, my wife's uh, love language, it turns out, is acts of service, uh, which kind of makes sense now. Um, 
for Thanksgiving, she asked me to donate time and find her a new husband. Uh, so you can tell that counseling went really well for us. Uh, we have a daughter, uh, just one, kind of a tough decision because I'm the youngest of three. My wife's the youngest of four, but we were like, we're just going to have one, you know? And uh, it, it was, it, it, I, I felt a little guilty talking to a friend of mine. He, he was kind of like, uh, are you going to have just one kid? I was like, yeah, I think so. And he's like, well, what if your daughter gets lonely? I started thinking about that. And I was like, you know what? That is her problem. You know what I mean? Like I got to create life because she's antisocial. I don't think so. I'll get her Netflix, maybe a cat, something. I don't know. I did uh, hit kind of a rock bottom recently as a dad, though. Um, there's no 12-step program for that, you know what I mean? There's like one step, they take your kid away. Um, I woke up one day, I'm not really a very responsible person, I woke up to a, an overdraft charge, and uh, you know, you get charged 34 bucks if you don't put money into your bank account, and I realized I didn't have any cash on hand. You know, um, my wife doesn't have cash because she's not working. I don't have cash because I'm married to my wife. And so we were like, how do we put money into the bank right away? And we both remembered that my daughter had just gotten her money uh, from her grandmother for Christmas and she got 200 bucks. And uh, my kid is very responsible, as you can tell. And so I don't know if you've ever had to uh, steal from your daughter's piggy bank. It's a little bit of a tricky situation, you know what I mean? I was like, it was like 6.30 in the morning, I went up to her room, uh, casing the joint, you know, looking for loose Lego pieces, anything that could distract me from this operation. And I don't know if you're aware of piggy banks, um, very, very loud. That's the problem with them. This is not a stealth operation. Very heavy, very loud. I accidentally, you know, I was flipping it over. I was trying to move that weird, you know, the the, the little plastic uh, button thing. I don't know, maybe kind of like a, a a poor woman's diaphragm. I don't know. Maybe you guys are an IUD crowd. I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm start. You know, I'm I'm trying to reach for that money. You know, I'm trying to feel that money in there, and the noise wakes my kid up, and you know, I'm like, this is not the time for this conversation. You know, what am I gonna tell her? Hey, don't have kids, you're gonna be broke. No, can't do that at that moment. And so I explained to her, hey, I need to borrow your money. And this is what's really heartbreaking is my, my daughter looked me in the eyes and she just goes, Daddy, it's okay, you can, you can keep that money. And uh, I was really, it just really broke my heart, you know, because uh, she's making me pay her back 40% interest. And, uh, you know, I did never, I never thought, you think your kid's gonna be a doctor, you never think they're gonna be a, a loan shark. Um, but uh, that's what she's doing, and she's doing a great job at it. So, uh, thanks for listening. Hi, everybody. My name is Pablo Mars, and my story is Almost Christmas. I'm usually good at an emergency. I don't panic or lose control. Earthquakes, I'm a native Angelino. Been there, done that. Medical emergencies, I'm an actor who's played a lot of doctors. And criminal ones, I've survived four muggings in my hometown of LA. But in December of 2016, I met my kryptonite, Orange County. I had planned a trip that year for my 88-year-old mother and myself to go to Fort Myers, Florida to visit family for Christmas. I was also going to teach an improv intensive workshop over the weekend at a friend's acting studio in St. Pete Clearwater. So I was going to kill two birds with one stone. It was going to be a perfect trip. I planned very carefully for this adventure to make sure that it was hassle free. After a year of caring for my mom, who was slowly slipping into pre-dementia, I was desperate for a break. I was exhausted. I found a super cheap flight online that was half the price of any others that I found. There was only one catch. We had to leave from the Santa Ana John Wayne Airport in Orange County. No worries. We would drive down the night before, rent a cheap motel room near the airport, 
and then avoid all the morning traffic. And it would still cost less if we flew from any other airport around. It was around 10 p.m. when we arrived at the West Coast Inn Motel in Santa Ana. The long freeway trip that was really just an hour felt like six. My mom's sundowners had kicked in, so the whole way there she was complaining about the trip being too long. Just, just, uh, this is too long, this is too, just, just stop the car and turn around. We finally arrived and walked up to the reservation kiosk in the parking lot. There was no lobby. I mean, this was a classy place. The uh, indifferent young man in the kiosk told us that we weren't on the reservation list. Um, I don't see your reservation. Are you sure you made one? Well, yes, of course I made one. I mean, it was prepaid. Please, please check again. Nope, it's not there. Just as I'm about to give up and rent another room just so we could get some sleep, he finds a reservation. Uh, I checked on the Hotel.com website, and yeah, it's there. Someone just entered the info wrong. <sighs> Great. Hallelujah. We get in our room, and soon we're fast asleep. Then, at about 5 a.m., my mom suddenly sits up in her motel room bed and says, Pablo, Pablo, wake up. Wake up, my tongue is swollen. My tongue is swollen. Huh? What? What? I said, still half asleep. My tongue is swollen. Wake up. Your tongue is... Oh, crap. Your tongue is swollen. So, I immediately go into emergency mode. My mom has angioedema. It's an allergic reaction that can flare up from a chemical, a food she might eat, or stress. It causes the swelling of the lips tongue and the cheek or go to our go-to medicine is always Benadryl when the swelling hits her cheeks and her lips my mom kind of looks like a monkey sort of like this if it hits the tongue then that's red alert it could swell up and block her airway and suffocate her now the procedure normally is that we go to the ER and they pump her full of antihistamines for about four or five hours. The swelling goes down and then it's all over. I know the drill, but for some reason at five o'clock in the frickin' morning in Orange County, I lose my mind. First of all, I give my mom two pills of Benadryl, which she's trying to take with a swollen tongue. If you really try to do that, you know it's impossible to swallow water and pills with a swollen tongue. I'm committing elder abuse. She's coughing, she's spitting up the pills in the water, and I see that it's not working. Then instead of running out to the motel clerk and asking him where the nearest ER is, or simply dialing 911, I decide to go on my computer and look for the nearest Kaiser Permanente Hospital, who's our, her Medicare provider. I found an address nearby, but didn't bother to write it down. I don't have a smartphone at the time. I'm not writing the address down. I don't have the GPS. I just look at the little Google map in the corner to see where it is in relation to the motel. Don't worry, I got this. My visual memory being so sharp, at five in the freaking morning, we arrive at the building, a Kaiser Permanente administrative office, no clinical services. I leave my mom in the car, I run into the building. It's 6.30 in the morning, I'm looking for someone to help us. There's nobody in the offices. I mean, I could have stolen everything in sight at that point. I'm starting to panic and I'm screaming, I'm a loser, I'm such a loser. In my head, <laughs> at her age, my mom's slightest suffering is heartbreaking. As her caregiver, I want to keep her from all harm. I run back to the car and did what I should have done at 5 in the morning. Call 911. Ten minutes later, five hunky firefighters come to the rescue. They're always hunky. And seeing these guys makes me even feel more like a loser. 
especially when I reflect back on the 30 pounds I was supposed to, you know, lose that year. And here they are, looking great. They give us directions to the nearest Kaiser. They take all her vital signs and say she's going to be okay. So, off we go. When we arrive, I explain to the ER doctor that we have a plane to catch, so we need to speed things up. The stocky female doctor who reminded me of Kathy Bates calmly said, oh, that's not going to happen. We were going to have to intubate her and possibly keep her overnight for observation. Oh, 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 no, 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 no. No, you see, uh, she just gets a booster of antihistamines and, and, and then we're out. That's it. Oh, no, no. We may have to intubate her. Oh, no, there's no way. <laughs> My feisty mom is never going to put up with that. She hates hospitals. She'll pull that tube right out and she'll strangle the doctor with it. Five hours and two canceled flights later, we finally left the hospital and we went home. I rebooked my flight for Florida the next day so I could still work, and my mom stayed the weekend with my aunt and my cousin. My mother had to stay home this time, but next time we'll avoid the stress and the dementia and the OC, and we'll leave from someplace that's calm and centered, like LAX. Hey, shout out to Santa Clarita, Newhall. Hey, everybody, how's it going? This is Tracy Lee Nelson, and I want to thank uh, you for inviting me to uh, do a couple clips and uh, share with you some of my music. This is for the uh, virtual uh, 10 by 10, and uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. The uh, first one here is called uh, My Baby Joanna. <laughs> Good. 
good time tonight. Yeah, baby. Let's have a good time tonight. Celebrate you and I. All right. Let's have a good time tonight, baby. Have a good time tonight. All right, come on, everybody. Feeling all right, right, right. Feeling so good, good, good. Feeling all right, right, right. Feeling so good, good, good. Feeling all right, right, right. Feeling so good, good, good. Feeling all right, baby. Feeling so good. Times. It's off my uh, most recent CD. It's called uh, Blues Loving Man, and that's on uh, CDBaby.com. Here's another one. This is uh, this is a uh, one from about uh, some of the locals over here. All right. I hope you guys love the blues here. A little twist in the blues, yeah. I hear the road traveling down every highway you know. The wind in his hair, an eagle above. The warrior rides with many spirits I'm told. Yeah, he's a red rider, rolling stone. He's a red rider, keeping spirit strong. Never looks back. His warrior strength is in his medicine bag. He rides through the night. Some days a ghost. I felt him fly by like a storm on the road. Yeah, he's a red ride, rolling stone. Yeah, he's a red ride, keeping the spirit strong. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, everybody out there in New Hall and Santa Clarita. Thank you, Jeff, for inviting me to share some of my music with you. And uh, everybody stay safe out there. Hello. My name is Sandia Annis, and I am a poet. I grew up in Santa Clarita, and I currently live in Castaic on a five-acre ranch where we enjoy a fresh garden, fruit trees, uh, along with fresh eggs from our chickens. Uh, we've had goats. Uh, currently we have three hair sheep. And yeah, it's a good life. It's a beautiful day outside. Hopefully maybe I can show you some of that if the wind dies down here. But I digress. I would like to share with you today, this is a book that I published through Amazon. It's called In Between. It it's poetry that I wrote from the time that I was a teenager into adulthood. It's 88 poems, and I would just like to share a couple with you, and I hope that you enjoy it. The passion grows, the flowers bloom, the fever burns, the people dance. The birds fly, the eagle soars, the opportunity knocks, the power of fear. The winds blow, the time is soon. The world turns, the moment's chance. The trees high, the time before. The sky opens, the people are here. You turn to me, and we see the world to return. Phone tag. Called my dear, wish he was here. Good to hear his voice. Now is our only chance. Phone tag recall, can't stand it at all. Goodbye to sleep alone, phone is on loan. Inspiration upon each ring, why am I in this thing? No security given, only the ears are driven. Always waiting by the phone, jumping to every tone. Is he just a flake? Am I making a mistake? Let it ring or make him stay. Decide now or keep it this way. The door. The door is open. I don't knock, you will see me anytime. Sometimes I don't take your advice. I just want you to be there. Why do you help? I don't knock, but just any time. Sometimes I do take your advice. You barely ever frown. Always a grin, and I am in. I don't want to smile today. I will close the door on my way out. I just wanted to say thank you very much for the main allowing me this opportunity to share my poetry, and I hope that you enjoyed it. And we'll see you next time. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Hello, my name is Alan Gittleson. I am a mentalist, Jewish, from Kentucky. That's right, I'm the only person from Kentucky who can read <laughs> people's minds. Uh, and tonight I am not here to read your mind, the fine people of Santa Clarita and beyond. I am here to present something that we would not normally get to share together, and that is something from my video archives, uh, something that's only been seen live and in person before this uh, by the people who were in a private home at a private event that was only for magicians who are focused on one trick the cups and balls, the oldest trick in magic. And I present to them something they've never seen before, which is something that I hope you will enjoy, something that has baffled many of the greatest minds in magic at this event for three years in a row. And now it's here for your viewing. Uh, without my quarantine haircut, I present myself doing the mentalists, cups and balls.
Hello. 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 Right. Uh, my name is Alan Gilson. I'm a mentalist, and I don't do the cups and balls. Uh, you did last year. You did last year. <laughs> but and now you got to prove it. <laughs> this is intermission. I'd like to demonstrate something for you that I don't believe is possible. So, um, and I'm going to need to work with somebody here. Uh, how about you, sir? What's your name? Lex. Lex? Yes. Come on up, Lex. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is a, a fake lemon of Kirk's, and what I'm going to ask you to do, I'm going to turn my back, and I want you to place this, uh, we've got five cups here, I want you to place it under any one of the cups, there's one through five, don't have to think of them as numbers, but any of them, and just place it underneath one of the cups. Okay. Okay? I'm going to go over here, you can just put your hands over my eyes, you block me, just lift up the cup, put down the fruit. And then put the cup over it. Okay. You got it? Yep. Yes. Am I ready to turn around? Yep. Yes. Okay, Lou's been blocking my vision. All right. And it is my job to figure out uh, which cup has the fruit underneath it to connect our minds and to uh, eliminate the ones that are. Mm -hmm. And I get a sense that it is not under this one. One down. I get a sense that, and that may be wrong here too, I don't know, it's not a perfect science. Like I said, I don't believe this is possible. Uh, I get a sense that it is not under this one either. Two down. I get a sense that it is not under this one either. Show you the one where it is. This one right here. Right here. Right here. Right here. In uh, cups and balls tradition, I'll, I'll keep some of that. So uh, maybe this is too confusing. Maybe there are too many cups. Uh, let's limit it down to just uh, three cups. Okay. So we'll have them one, two, and three. And just go ahead, and uh, I'm going to turn my back. You know what? Uh, why don't you come up here, Lou, and just uh, go ahead and block my vision. All right? And then go ahead and tip, lift up one of the cups, put the fruit underneath it. In fact, why don't we move over this way just a little bit? All right, there we go. Okay. And put it down. Mm -hmm. And now it's hidden. Yeah. Yes? Yes. All set? Okay, thank you very much, Lou. Okay, fantastic. Let's think about which one has it underneath. Okay. Um, okay, interesting. I get a sense that it's going to be right. You're not going to go for one of those extremes. You went right for the center. Yes, fantastic. <laughs> Let's do it two more times, because that would be impossible. Come on up, Lou, and just block me. Okay, fantastic. Go ahead. Hide the fruit and just hide it under any of those. Can be one, two, or three. Middle, right, left, center, whatever you like. Let me know when you are done. Done. You're done? Okay. Fantastic. Just look at me, just think about which one has it. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, I get a sense. Oh, you are not the kind of guy who would repeat a pattern. So it is not under the center. It is going to be under the one on my far right. <laughs> and, uh, let's go one more time, Lou. Cover my vision. All right. And try and just put it under one of those cups. You can adjust the other cups if you need. Just keep them in a line. That helps me. Okay. <laughs> you said do keep them in a line? Do keep them in a line. That, that's very helpful for me. It helps, helps keep my thoughts and your thoughts organized. Okay? You got it? Yeah. You ready for me to turn around? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Lou. Give Lou a big round of applause. For having me up there. Right. And uh, just think about where it is. Okay. Interesting. You little dickens. <laughs> <laughs> a little different. I, I said something.
something the last time. I said something about not wanting to uh, repeat a pattern. And then you went back to what you did at this first, which I also mentioned, and you put it right under the center. <laughs> Ah, well, I hope you enjoyed that nearly as much as I enjoyed presenting it to my audience at the time. And uh, I do want to point out something that uh, I love to touch people's hearts and their minds to get them scratching their heads, which thanks to my quarantine haircut, I can do much more closely now. I did want to point out that uh, I hope I influenced all of you tonight to have a good time. Oh, and one last thought, since I'm a mentalist and I am supposed to know what you are thinking, and that is many of you are thinking, what's with all the elaborate green screen technology? I know that's just computer stuff. It's, it's fake. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is out in the real world where I hope you and I will be together soon as soon as it is safely possible. Thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you soon. She cried in her sleep, and it broke my heart. But she laughed it off like a joke where no one laughs, except for the one someone who delivered the punchline. And when my heart in real life broke, she cried in my wake. And finally, I was the lucky one. She cried for me. But it was too late. We couldn't go back. Just lucky to have been loved by someone. Who cried in her sleep. She cried so at my wake. Not to be outdone. She didn't cry rivers. No. No, she cried lakes. At last, this would be the one joke that finally laughed. It's been six months, three days, and four hours since you ended us. It's been hard. I miss your everything. And for you to say I don't love you enough to fight for us. Oh my gosh. Well. 
it just breaks my heart. You are the only person on this planet who I couldn't love more, who I can't stop thinking about, who I want forever, for always, for keeps. God. For eternity. Look beautiful. It's you. It always has been and it always will be. I know it's hard for you to understand why our love is something I absolutely can't share with my family. But if you knew them, then you'd understand. And I know that hurts you for me to keep you hidden away. My little dark secret. But that's the catch. Because how could you know them if they don't even know you exist? Trust me, no. if they knew you existed, you still wouldn't get to know them because they wouldn't invite you to family events. And if I brought you anyway, and they would ignore you, treat you badly. They would hurt you. Mom. So, in a way, I was saving you from that. But as it turns out, there's no saving anything or anyone. And trying to save you I lost. And I just can't. Lose you. Joss. I'm going to do it. I'm going to tell my mother. I will tell my family. And we will be free to love. As we've done. All these years. Please tell me that if I do this. You will come back to me. Will you come back? She was my daughter. <laughs> she was my daughter. <laughs> Ryan was my friend. You look like her. 
she looks like me. Looked. She looked like me.
and to cheer them upward, to set the principle of self-government at work, to agitate these Herculean masses, to establish a new Hello, 10 by 10, and hello, virtual audience. Thanks for having me. I'm Kim Kalish, and I hope everyone is being really safe and baking a ton of bread and then counteracting that by taking up running. That's what I did. Well, join me in the bed breaking. The bread, the bread baking, and the running. <laughs> okay, let's get into this. So I went to a really um, uh, snobby college. Uh, I went to this like snob hill sort of liberal arts college in uh, called Dickinson College. It likes to tout itself as the first college in the nation. It was the first college uh, formed after the Revolutionary War. It of course likes to ignore that like Yale and Harvard existed, but that's where we're at. We are the first in the nation, and and we like to be be pretentious in order to prove that we've been around for a long time. So uh, senior year, as an English major, I had to write a 50-page thesis. That was the deal. Your entire senior year was based on one grade from this one paper. And if you didn't do well, 
you didn't graduate as so like this honor society society that was a little vague on how you got in but if you did really well in the thesis you might get in and there was all these pressures so that thesis was due before school ended it was due like sometime in april and then the same day that that was due the history majors uh, thesis was also due also a 50 page paper so both of these papers were due at like 2 p.m on a friday so of course by the time 2 p.m. on Thursday came, I had like, you know, a reasonable amount of the paper. That's a liberal half. I probably had closer to like 20 pages. Uh, and I wasn't alone in that. Like half of the campus was doing these theses. And frankly, we were all in college. So we were drinking our faces off and we weren't really doing work. And there was a lot of senioritis. So whatever. 24 hours before, I had to write like 30 pages worth of, of material. And this is 2006, so Google Docs didn't exist yet. And so what I was doing is uh, I was writing and I was saving the uh, copy to my laptop. And then I had a USB drive and I was saving a copy of that to my USB drive. And then every once in a while, I would email myself a copy. But again, it's 2006, uploading an attachment to an email took a while and again I was a dumb college student so I only did that once in a while so let's fast forward to about 4 a.m. in the morning on the day it's due I'm up to probably 35 pages at this point and I'm feeling pretty good I just did a big rewrite on all of these pages and within the last you know couple hours I had just written about 15 pages because something always happens, right? Like once it hits midnight on the day it's due, my brain clicks into like, is deadline time? And I drink my Earl Grey and I eat my M&Ms and I go into like overdrive for productivity. It's always the way I work. Even now, much to the chagrin of my bosses, I am great four hours before a deadline. I'm not so great 24 hours before. So it's 4 a.m. Um, I'm doing great. I'm feeling good. I feel like I finally worked out this like highly pretentious topic, which I'm going to tell you now. Please hold your applause. Uh, it is <clears throat> reimagining theater, the amalgamated form of theater David Mamet uses and his gender politics as seen through his play Sexual Perversity in Chicago. If you understand what that title meant, I applaud you. I reread this thesis about four years ago. I'm not even sure I know what I'm saying. I kind of know what I'm saying. Whatever. It was about theater. So, feeling great, right? Everything's groovy. I'm listening to music. I'm sitting on the uh, living room of my uh, college apartment, and I'm writing. One of my roommates is a history major. She's up all night. She's writing her thesis. Next door to me are my two best friends, Mandy and Andrea, Andrea's an English major, Mandy's a history major. They're writing their theses. One of their roommates is named Becca, also writing her thesis, like literally half the campus. It's 4 a.m. Feeling great. Everything's going well. And then my computer goes black. And then it sort of makes this weird noise, like a mini explosion. And then the teeniest little smoke comes out of my computer and then it turns back on and the entire computer is wiped clean the whole thing okay it's okay right it's okay don't freak out don't freak out you've been also sending a copy to your USB drive cool right let's do this so I go and click onto my USB drive and hey guess what whatever just exploded my computer also exploded a USB drive. So that's gone, totally blank, totally gone. The computer's starting to make like some weird noises again. And I was like, holy God, what do I do? So then I go, okay, I've emailed it to myself. So I go into my email and I go to check and it turns out I have not emailed myself anything since 11 p.m. the night before. I lost 15 pages of rewrites. I lost all of the, the structural, I lost everything basically. Everything else was hot garbage five hours before, and that is what I'm left with. So I start to melt down. I start to cry because this girl is a crier. I start to cry. I try to talk to my roommate about it. She goes, hey, this is really stressful, and I'm sorry this has to happen to you, but also I have to write my thesis. That's fair. I go over to my best friends. What am I going to do? They all tell me they love me, but guess what? They've got to write their own theses. 
goodbye, talk to you later. Oh my God. So I run out the door and I start looking for any, uh, you know, computer lab in the college. Every single computer is taken. I start, I go to the 24 hour library and this library is gigantic because again, pretentious liberal arts college. But guess what? Every single computer is taken. I even break into the writing center, which I am a tutor at. I freaking break in there, pick the lock, try to get to one of those computers. Guess what? I'm not the only one. Every single computer is taken. So I go back to my apartment completely defeated. I sit on the floor. I text my boyfriend at the time. And then I just start to cry. And I crumble into a little fetal position because I'm done. I have no way to fix this. My computer is basically not working and also very untrustworthy. I have on all the work I've done and the hill feels insurmountable. So, 10 minutes later, my boyfriend comes charging into my apartment, looks through the mess around him, grabs my book bag, starts putting all of the books into the book bag throws it over his shoulder, takes his hands, puts them under me, and picks me up like a and walks me out of my apartment. He walks down the hall to his apartment. He sits me upright onto his kitchen table. He grabs the pot of tea that he has brewed before coming over to get me, fixes me a mug of tea, opens up his computer, kisses me on the forehead and says, if you need anything else, I'll be on the couch. And that's where he goes and he promptly falls asleep. And that is how I finished my thesis. In, by the way, at 11.59, excuse me, 1.59, it was due at 2 p.m. I got beat plus. I did not get into the honor society, but got beat plus and I graduated with Greek honors. I'm showing off because I'm pretentious. Because I went to a pretentious liberal arts college. Dickinson has us um, save copies of our thesis. It's down somewhere in the dungeons of Dickinson College. And I put a thank you uh, section and I put a dedication in front of my thesis. And if you go there and you look up Kim Kalish, class of 2006, Look at my David Mamet and gender politics and amalgamated theater thesis. You will find a dedication page that says to Patrick Michael McMurphy and his computer. For without them, this paper would never come into existence. And that's how I graduated college. I hope everyone is staying safe. You can find me at, at Kim Kalish on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, and God, you can even find me on LinkedIn.
Phil Van T. Let's start tonight with a, an optical illusion. This is performed with four cards, four big old cards. Two of these cards have holes in them, two of them do not. The first card has a hole in it. The second card does not have a hole in it. The third card, no hole. And the fourth card, wait for it, most definitely has a hole. Let's add a little color. Oh, pretty. My favorite. If I was to place the hole card over the color card, you get what appears to be a spot card. It's a good illusion. I could do the same thing to this white card here, but because it is white on white, it probably won't be as effective. Sort of like a polar bear in a snowstorm effect there. If I do it a little bit faster though, now that's a good illusion. I mean, that's a really good illusion. Now, some folks like their spot cards a little bit bigger. I got you covered, but I had to cheat to do that. I had to use extra spots. Think about what you've seen now. You've seen a spot card. You've seen a whole bunch of spots. You've seen a beautiful color card, my favorite. And you've seen a big spot card with a hole in it. If you think real hard though, what you never actually saw was that uh, second hole card I was talking about. That's because I saved that for the finale. <laughs> Not bad for an optical illusion. Some of my favorite spots are on dice. We'll call this rolling the dice. And if I stop somewhere, I'm going to end up with uh, eight on the top. Eight on the top, there's going to be six on the bottom. How do I know this? It always adds up to 14. You can fool a three-year-old with that maybe once or twice, if you want to call it a trick. There's a seven. There'll be seven on the bottom, too. It always adds up to 14. Now, that happens with legitimate dice. These are legitimate dice. They're extra large. I got them from my senior citizen shows. I got tired of doing a really good job for the seniors, and all I ever heard at the end was, I couldn't see a darn thing. Who let you in here? Now keep your eyes on the dice, please, because I'm about to cheat. If you ever see a pair of dice with 11 on the top and 11 on the bottom, this is a bad thing. Run the other way. You should have always only, ding, ding, only always. I wasn't lying at that particular moment. A grand total of only 14. Same with the three. If you ever see three on the top and three on the bottom, is this a good thing? Already know we're in the other way. Should be always only, ding, ding, only always, grand total of 14. This gets kind of redundant after a while. Let's try a 9 and 5. 9 on the top, 5 on the bottom, 14. Now notice that the 5 is made up of a, a 3 and a 2. Another way to make 5 on the dice would be uh, four and one. Easy peasy. Very similar to magic. Let's try a backwards nine. The five never changes with a backwards nine. I read that somewhere. 
Notice how the, uh, the one is pointed off in that direction there. Okay. We could take extreme advantage of the one because he's all by his lonesome. We could attract him with sound. He's moving towards the sound. He's moving. He's moving. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And you don't need a long drawn out sound either. It could just be a, a quick little <laughs> girly noise like that. Now you know how to cheat at dice. Did anyone else teach you how to cheat at dice? Who's your friend? Speaking of cheating, I want to show you a little con man false bill count. W.C. Fields performed this in a movie called You Can't Cheat an Honest Man, which isn't true. You can. You just have to really apply yourself. Here's what the bill count looks like. If you ever see anyone counting bills over their finger while you're getting your change, run the other way. They're about to cheat you. I can't show you how it works, but here's what it looks like. Let's say you're supposed to get 30 dollars and change. Here you go, sir. Thirty thirty dollars. One, two, three, four, five, and five is ten, and five is fifteen, twenty, thirty dollars. Now everything looks hunky dory till you get home and you find out you've only got ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, did he just take a dollar from you? Let's give him the benefit of the doubt and we'll recount it here. You got one, two, three, four, and five is nine. Five is fourteen, nineteen, twenty-nine. Nineteen twenty-nine is about the last year that a dollar was a good profit. Being a greedier con man, I want a little bit bigger profit, so I came up with a new method. Much better, if I do say so myself. It looks the same to start with. $30 coming at you. One, two, three. If I go too fast, let me know. Four, five. Five is ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty dollars. Now, in my method, I can show you all five of the ones. Old school method, you couldn't do that. One, two, three, four, five. But when you get home, you find you've only got one, two, three, four, five, and five is ten, fifteen. Did he just take uh, five dollars from you? Benefit of the doubt, well, count it again. Ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. Yeah. Now you're going to be mad at me, and you're going to come after me, and you're going to throw this pile of money on the table and say, Mister, you owe me 30 bucks, and you'd best pay it up or else. And I'll say, Oh, it's all right here. Let me count it. And you say, No, none of that sleight of hand stuff. I want it fair and square. So being a coward like most con men, I keep an, uh, an additional uh, extra emergency uh, 10 and 20, which I hand to you, and you waltz off happy, hopefully. But it's a shame you didn't take the original pile of money, because I did pretty good for myself at the end of the night. I have a tidy little profit of one, two, three, four, five, five is ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, thirty, forty bucks, all in all. Not a bad little uh, two and a half minute profit there. Folks, thanks for spending a couple minutes with me uh, in your home, in my home. Please stay safe. I can't wait till we get a chance to meet again.